welcome to another episode of McGovern Neurology Nuggets. My name is Kate Nam, and I'm one of the neurology residents at UT Houston. Um, and we have here today with us Dr. Bill Ligler, who is one of our favorite neuromuscular uh, faculty members here, but also our amazing program director. Um, thank you for coming, Dr. Villigiler. Thank you, Kate, for this great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we wanted to discuss um, inflammatory myopathies. Um, since our, our Dr. Villigiler's um, interest is, is, is in neuromuscular disorders. So first, we'd like to start with the classification of uh, inflammatory myop my myopathies. Uh, thank you, Kate. That's a great question because the classification of inflammatory myopathies has changed based on the recent advances we achieved in this field. There have been discovery of several antibodies uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, as well as new findings in our uh, pathology knowledge. Before, we used to clump a lot of the IBM patients, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy patients, overlap myositis patients, antisynthetase patients in the polymyositis group. And then we had the dermatomyositis group and all the patients who had a muscle problem or elevated CK mm -hmm. plus a rash, they got the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. And all the rest, we're in the polymyositis group. But now that we have knowledge of these antibodies in each of these distinct uh, inflammatory myopathy disorders, uh, we know that the polymyositis is actually very rare. Mm -hmm. And some of us are also bold enough to, to say that polymyositis doesn't exist. I don't know if I'm that bold yet, uh, but that's also uh, in, uh, an approach that we can, or some of us take. So uh, this is important to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are some labs we can you know, check for to kind of um, go about using that classification for different inflammatory myopathies? So there are several antibodies, and you know I am a fan of ordering mm -hmm. antibodies yeah. because these antibodies help us. Mm -hmm. uh, Significantly, it help, they help us to customize our treatments uh, in, for our patients. They help us customize our workup approach uh, in our patients. And um, if we want to sort of uh, dive into a little bit of the antibodies, I know that we have limited time, but I'll try to summarize it as much as I can. We have uh, the SRP and the HMGCR uh, CoA antibodies, which we see in immune-mediated necrotizing myopathies. If uh, patients have HMGCR uh, CoA antibodies uh, or they are seronegative, they don't harbor any antibodies, then we need to search for also malignancy. SRP positive patients do not usually uh, present as a perineoplastic syndrome in uh, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathies, or as we call it, IMNM. Uh, but these patients can also can have cardiac involvement. So I usually do a uh, basic like routine echo in these patients. Mm -hmm. But in the seronegative and HMGCR CoA, I uh, actually make sure that they have their age-appropriate cancer screening uh, up, uh, and. Uh, I also do a pan-CT in these patients. When we talk about dermatomyositis, we have uh, several antibodies. Me Too uh, antibodies, these patients, uh, they present with the typical findings, uh, uh, the rash, the pathology will be very typical. MDA5 patients, uh, though, they're, they're very different, they're very unique in the sense that their pathology might be very uh, bland. Uh, they might not show that much of inflammation. Um, but these patients can have rapidly progressive lung disease. So they have uh, interstitial lung disease, and this might actually be fatal. So whenever we see uh, 
an MDA-5 positive patient, we should uh, collaborate with our pulmonology uh, colleagues and then, uh, my, and then we'll need to treat these patients aggressively uh, regarding their lung involvement. Uh, NXP2 and uh, Tifan Gamma positive patients, uh, these patients, they have really increased, significantly increased uh, risk factor for developing malignancy. All dermatomyositis patients, they do, um, except for MDA5. Um, ME2 might be a little bit less uh, than the others, but especially NXP2 and T4 and gamma patients, uh, their risk for malignancy is very, very high. So if we see these patients, then we have to be much more aggressive in our uh, diagnostic workup uh, for malignancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting because it changes uh, management in these patients and it should be more like an individual approach. Exactly. Um, exactly. Based on the antibodies. That's very exactly. Interesting. So the treatments too, for example, SRP positive patients, there are several uh, reports uh, actually suggesting that rituximab uh, mm -hmm. will be better or these patients will respond better to rituximab, right? We can customize our treatments too based on the antibody findings. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. So in your clinic, I've been to in your cl cl clinic before with seeing patients, um, you know, we have suspected myositis and some people, we, te we send these antibodies and they end up coming back negative. What are some other things we can do or other things c to consider when this happens? First of all, you need to make sure that that's what the diagnosis is, an inflammatory myopathy because Sometimes hereditary myopathy patients, they can have inflammation even in their biopsies. They can have elevated CK, which will respond to uh, steroids, for example, and then you might misdiagnose these patients as myositis, and then you're gonna expose them to unnecessary uh, treatments. Uh, and if you're not sure uh, about what's going on, mm -hmm. Um, then, and the antibody um, uh, is negative. Um, so I suggest first, if this profile is really negative or are we dealing with a false negative uh, pros uh, problem? Uh, so know what type of assay your lab is using. For example, is it a Lyme blot or something else? Uh, what is the sensitivity, specificity for, um, for these assays in that patient group? Uh, if th there, is the, there is a patient that I know uh, for sure this is an inflammatory myopathy, or there's a patient with several antibodies positive, again, that might be false positive if we have multiple antibodies, then what I do is I make sure that I send uh, uh, the, that patient's uh, specimen to a lab where they check the antibodies uh, with immunoprecipitation because that's the um, gold standard. And then if it, immunoprecipitation still it's negative, then I'll call it seronegative or maybe I'm dealing with something else. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some of those antibodies, multiple antibodies, all of a sudden disappear and then now I have only one antibody. Uh, positive, then that makes me feel more comfortable about the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then um, also there are several other techniques that we can use. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody who has a rash will have dermatomyositis. Uh, in these patients, uh, I uh, do muscle biopsy, and muscle biopsy is uh, very helpful. For example, in antisynthetase syndrome patients, uh, the perifascicular involvement will show necrotic fibers, whereas in dermatomyositis, the perifascicular uh, fibers will be more um, atrophic. Mm. Uh, so that might make me suspicious uh, for an antisynthetase syndrome, for example, based on if I'm seeing more uh, necrotic fibers, mm -hmm. and that's going to help me. Another entity or um, diagnostic technique, I use imaging a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. as you know, uh, and I like to image the muscles, and uh, we can do T1 uh, sequences for fatty infiltration, and then the STIR sequences for edema. Uh, so those two sequences will be enough, and we can image four extremities in about 40, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at the pattern. Hey, what type of pattern does this patient have? Maybe 
uh, flexor uh, digitorum muscles, profundus muscles will be uh, affected, hey, maybe then that's IBM. Uh, or um, a pattern that might be suggestive of a specific uh, hereditary myopathy uh, might help us um, reach that hallelujah moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so all of these are uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that they sound all very helpful, and it seems like that these have been kind of more advancing, like recently. So this is very exciting. Um, and lastly, um, I wanted to discuss like um, because a lot of patients come into clinic and they kind of ask for patient counseling and ask for like lifestyle modification, including exercises. Do you have any t tips you give to patients? I do, and I always say exercise is medicine. Uh, and as we say, food is medicine, exercise is medicine. So there have been several studies showing uh, the benefit of exercise in inflammatory myopathy patients. Before, we used to say, no, 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 don't exercise, you're going to hurt your muscles. Uh, but now we know that that's not true. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, probably be invited back uh, for another episode. Uh, then we can talk about our treatment options and also exercise and our initiatives that we're uh, actually taking in our clinics for our patients, myositis patients and also uh, myopathy patients. So I guess we got ourselves invited for another yeah, episode. Guess, what do you think? Yeah, I think we have to okay. come back here yeah. for another episode. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for today. Um, so just to summarize, we discussed inflammatory myopathies, um, their cl cl um, classification, and also importance of testing for antibodies and different diagnostic tools today. And we'll definitely come back to discuss more on treatment and exercise. So thank you so much for listening, and thank, thank you, you, Dr. B, for um, thank joining you, us. Yeah. I, I loved our session. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.